Okay, Boker Tov, this is our third out of four great high holiday sermons for today. Uh, two weeks ago, we studied a pre-high holiday sermon of Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb from 1973. Last week, uh, we studied a sermon from Rav Yehuda Amital of Rosh Hashanah, 1984. And now we're going back in time a half century or so um, from the previous two to truly one of my new favorite uh, over the last couple of years, new favorite um, rabbis and sermon writers, Rav Moshe Avigdor Amiel. We studied him in our Modern Jewish Thinkers series uh, last summer, and I've had a little bit of other exposure to him. A uh, few couple of words of, of uh, biography for the context, and then we're going to dive right in. It's a very, it. I, I'm, I think for the listening ear, it wasn't such a long sermon, but to read it's a bit of a long sermon, uh, so I'm going to take the reins and try to take us through it uh, all the way through over the course of the time that we have together. Rabbi Amiel um, was born in the 1880s in uh, the Russian-German border area, and he first served as a rabbi uh, in the 19-teens uh, in a town which I won't be able to pronounce correctly, but is spelled in English G-R-A-J-E-W-O. Rajavo, maybe, um, on the Russian-German border. He served as a rabbi in that community during the period of the First World War, um, was an early Zionist affiliated with the Mizrahi movement, uh, and around the year 1920 uh, or so, he gave a talk at a Mizrahi convention, which kind of was so incredibly impactful, it got his name on the more global rabbinic stage, and he was invited to become the chief rabbi of Antwerp. He moved there and spent about 15 years, here we go, spent about 15 years, Stel just saying that her mother came from Antwerp, he spent about 15 years building and developing the Jewish community there, educational infrastructure, uh, and all kinds of work, um, and was a you know tremendously influential figure in that time. Uh, in a fascinating historical moment, in 1935, he beat out uh, Rav Yitzchak Halevi Herzog, who later became the first chief rabbi of, of Israel, uh, and Rav Yosef Dov Salavechik, who we now call the Rav of blessed memory. Um, he was the third uh, competitor uh, for the position of chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and he won. And uh, he moved to Israel uh, in 1936 and spent 10 years as the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv Yafo until his passing. Um, we have a, a bunch of his writings. He published an important book on Jewish thought. Um, he was really incredibly widely read and, and learned both in breadth and depth. Um, we have some uh, sophisticated uh, halachic writings of his analysis of the Jewish modes of transactions, Darkei Kinyanim, and other um, things on more obscure Jewish topics. And we have his sermons. Um, we have a few different volumes of his sermons and sermonic type writings. One of them is called Durashot El Ami, mm -hmm. Sermons to My People. Uh, his name, Rav Moshe Amiel, it's a play on his name, um, El Ami and Amiel. And um, these were Durashot given in his first rabbinic post. So we're talking about in the 19 teens, as he guides a community on the Russian-German border through the First World War and its aftermath. Um, this drasha was given an uh, in, in the volume of Drashot El Ami, his High Holiday Sermons, uh, it always begins with the date and sort of the setting. So the Rosh Hashanah sermons always say, Lifnet Kiat Shofar, that these things were delivered before the beginning of the Shofar blast. That's a very intentional choice um, because we try as much as we can not to uh, interrupt from the first Shofar blast until the conclusion of the Rosh Hashanah service with the Shofar blast at the end of the Musaf Tefillah. The normal sermon slot in many synagogues is uh, right when the Torah is being put away and before the Musaf Amidah, but that's already after the first set of shofar blasts. So those who want to be particular not to interrupt, give their sermon before the shofar service begins. Um, that is indeed my custom, uh, and it was Rev Amiel's custom. So he writes often at the beginning of the sermon, this was delivered before the first shofar blasts. And in fact, many of his drashot, as many Rosh Hashanah drashot do, 
focus in some way on the message of the shofar. The feature uh, of Rav Amiel's writings that I find most moving um, is the way in which he doesn't do in-depth analyses of texts typically. He refers to psukim or midrashim in a very fluid and fluent sort of way and has clever and sharp just kind of twists and takes on an individual verse or a midrash um, in a way that just sort of shows that he spoke the language, the idiom of the Tanakh, and it was the way he saw the world as well as rabbinic literature. Um, compared to Rabbi Lam, whose drasha really kind of delved into one idea, the idea of kind of standing your ground no matter what uh, the rest of the world says, and one figure, Rabbi Elazar Hagadol, who uh, um, Rabbi Elazar Hagadol, who, who who demonstrated that, and by contrast to Rabbi Amital, who saw maybe six or seven different sources and interwove them, this is a more conversational style of drasha, and um, and it and it touches lightly on different sources, just kind of much more in the in the flow of the teaching. So um, I think it reads for me, it reads most powerfully of all the three drashot, even just in its written form. Um, and I can imagine it being delivered with great passion. It's also in a historical moment, which is so profound. Um, the aftermath of the First World War, uh, the tremendous losses that were endured over that period of time, and kind of the question of where do we go from here. Um, and uh, so I find it to be a powerful one. And we're going to just read straight through. And as we, you know, I'll try along the way to point out the little textual interpretations and moves that he's uh, doing, which are not always obvious from the English, but where you see quotation marks, he's usually quoting a little piece of liturgy. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll try to clarify those those uh, flourishes that he's that he's offering. I think the overarching message of this sermon is does two things. And I think a Rosh Hashanah sermon ought to do these two things. One is to talk about what what did we experience in this past year? What, you know, to give people a moment to reflect on what have we lived through since we were last together last Rosh Hashanah, to name the challenges and to somehow incorporate a message of hope, not a saccharine or Pollyannish message of hope, um, but something that people can hold on to as they go forward into the year ahead. That's what I think Rav Amiel accomplishes here. He, yes, Estelle. Did, did he, in what language did he give this? He gave this in Hebrew. It's actually a beautiful Hebrew. It's a very conversational Hebrew. In fact, there's a spot pretty early on where he says, Chaval, like, what a pity, a very conversational Hebrew, you know, even though Hebrew was really only in its, in, modern Hebrew is only in its infancy, um, but he uses, I think, a beautiful modern Hebrew. Israel Palestine. This was, no, this was given in, this was in 1919. It was when he was still a rabbi on the Russian-German border in this town of Rajevo, and it was delivered there. Um, but it was in Hebrew, uh, and um, the translation here is a combination of Google Translate with my edits. Google Translate has gotten better and better. So it's actually quite remarkable that you could put a sermon with so much, you know, rabbinic text and, and lit liturgy in it and get out a pretty good, uh, um, pretty good uh, translation. But I had to make some edits to make it correct. Yes, Ellen. If he was giving this in, in Europe, in Germany, and why is it in, why did he speak Hebrew at that point in conversational Hebrew? Yeah. Not, you know, it's a great question. Prayer. It's a great question. Um, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe he translated it from a different language into Hebrew at a later point. I I didn't re I didn't check in the intro if he addresses it. It just seemed to me that it was delivered in Hebrew. But it's a great question. Did the community did they understand Hebrew? Right. So maybe maybe I'm yeah. Good question. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he he re retranslated it into Hebrew at a later point. Um, yeah, maybe that's a more, maybe that's a better, uh, more likely possibility. I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to the question. I just naively assume since it was written in Hebrew that it was delivered in Hebrew. Um, but it certainly is a question. Would his con community have understood Hebrew? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, homework for me. So uh, please leave that as an un un unknown. No, no, it's wonderful. That's why we get together. So you can uh, point, show me the things where I made in perhaps inaccurate assumptions. So um, we'll see if we, if we can get to the bottom of that by next time which will be, by the way, uh, after Rosh Hashanah, um, the week between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we'll meet again. Okay, so this is called Kra Satan, Rend the Satan. 
Uh, and um, he begins with two quotes. And again, I also don't know, did he kind of write these in afterwards or did he literally stand up and first say these two quotes? Blessed are the people who know the true are blessed. God, in the light of your face, they will walk. This is one of the verses that is read um, immediately after the show, the first shofar service. So it's going to be read in just a few moments after he delivers this sermon. And then soon after that, we read, Blessed are the people who dwell in your house, they will still sing you praises. That's part of the daily liturgy. We just noticed the juxtaposition. Uh, in the English, it's blessed and blessed. In the Hebrew, it's ashrei as the first word of each of those lines. The value of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. And with the yesterday day that will pass, that's a reference to a line from Psalms, ki yomet mol ki avok, how quickly time passes like, like a yesterday. The year 5679 passed from us forever and entered into the many years, counting from the six days of Genesis, which gave life to every living being and went to their worlds. Meaning this year has passed on, just like all living things that pass on. And a new year, the year 5680 in Hebrew, Taf Resh Pei, or as the wordsmiths call it, the year of Perat, because if you rearrange Taf Resh Pei, you get Pei Resh Taf. And people often like to kind of play around with acronyms of the words parat, maybe from the Euphrates or the language of proliferation, with her majesty of the unknown, inherits her place. And just a poetic way of saying one year has passed, another now is taking its place. Rosh Hashanah. But how few are the people in the world relatively for whom this day is truly Rosh Hashanah, right? It's a Jewish holiday. What does it have to do with everybody else? Only for one people, the least of all peoples, numerically, the Jews, is it considered Rosh Hashanah? But all 70 nations, indeed, they count a different count of years, completely different, and do not know the value of this day at all, right? It's Rosh Hashanah, but kind of really only for us. Indeed, these nations will still think whatever they think, and yet we know that the world was conceived today for the whole world, and about the countries on this day it will be said, these are two quotes from the Rosh Hashanah liturgy. Hayom harat olam. The whole world was conceived on this day. It's part of we say, what we say as part of the shofar liturgy. And in the um, in the Musaf of, of Rosh Hashanah, we say, Ba'al ha-medinot bo ye'amer. On this day, judgment will be rendered about all the nations. Now Rav Amiel is saying, yes, it's only a holiday for the Jewish people, but it is actually the new year in some way for the whole world, whether they know it or not. And yes, Rosh Hashanah is today not only in the Sidor and the Machzor, but it is Rosh Hashanah for everything that has been made under the sun. And the sun itself, right? It's Rosh Hashanah for all of creation. Look at it, and you will see that the constellation of scales, Mazal Moznaim, that is the horoscope sign of Libra, is on it, right? Rosh Hashanah falls out between usually September uh, you know, and October when it is the zodiac sign of Libra. Why? Why is it the zodiac sign of Libra? Because it's the scales. They're balancing for the month of Tishrei that one is often lowered and one is raised. Meaning he's trying to point out to us the sort of whether the world realizes it or not. There are kind of these subtle hints that um, it is a Rosh Hashanah for the whole world. Rosh Hashanah is the yard site. Now, we normally call Rosh Hashanah the birthday of the world. If you were sitting there in the room and he says Rosh Hashanah is the yard site of the world, you would be taken aback. And, and for naught, everyone has a special yard site on one of the days of the year. Meaning, why does everyone observe yard site on the anniversary of the death of their loved one? Rosh Hashanah is the yard site for everyone. What does he mean? Because in Rosh Hashanah, we say this as part of the Unatana Tokef. Kol ba'e olam ya'avlun lefanecha kivnei maron. All those in the world pass before you like sheep of the flock. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, what is b'nei maron? Sheep of the flock. How so? The Gemara explains. We have the idea of the um, tithing of animals. Uh, every tenth animal is given as a gift to the priest, to God. And the way they would do it is the animals would pass under the staff and every tenth animal will get marked with a little uh, a, a mark of dye on it to know that this one was going to be the one that, that is, is designated for God. And when a mother saw this, she was happy, right? The mother of all these sheep that are going under the under the you know staff and then the 10th one being marked. A mother seeing her child be marked with this little, her, her sheep child being marked with this little uh, mark of dye would be happy. 
because her child was decorated in such a beautiful color. And then when she saw how her child was led to the slaughter, this, uh, you know, slaughtered uh, um, Bechor, she would cry a whole third of tears. But had this poor mother thought of the fact that her crying should start immediately from this die, D-Y-E, from this dying? In other words, there's this disconnect. You see what looks like a beautiful thing, this beautiful marking that your, you know, child sheep is getting. And little do you know that it's actually the mark of the fact that they're going to be slaughtered as a, as a firstborn or as a maser, as a tithe, right? And so actually there should be a moment of sadness when they get this mark. But the mother only sees the beauty. Rosh Hashanah is the die. And all the slaughters that take place during the year all come from this mark. Meaning, on Rosh Hashanah, in the traditional understanding, God judges who will live and who will die over that year. So the, the death sentence, I'm sorry to say it in a harsh way, the death sentence, no matter when it's carried out in the coming year for the people who will die in that year, is placed on Rosh Hashanah. That's their yard site. That's when the sentence is given. Okay, So all the yard sites you recorded are nothing but a mistake because there's only one yard site. That is Rosh Hashanah. And who knows how many people stand now in the synagogue with that die mark on their faces. And it's a pity, chaval, she'inam margishim zot. They don't feel it. Okay, so this is, yeah, so this is, okay, this, yes, the die, the die mark. Yes. So this is the rabbi setting the weighty tone of the moment and reminding us that this is the judgment day and some of us may not survive the year and it's known right now. And maybe we want to think about what that might mean for us. Okay. Again, may feel overly harsh, maybe too much. Okay. This is Rav Amiel addressing his community. Right. Maybe Mama Toby says, is it really a pity that you don't know? Maybe it's better not to know. Yeah. Okay. Good. While for the entire world, this past year will be considered the greatest year of peace. Because in this year, world peace was written and signed, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. For us, this year was rather the year of the greatest war, the like of which has never been seen in our world. A year when the whole world declared war on us with great bitterness, and they all came out against us with their swords and bows. There are 70 nations in the world, good and bad, enlightened and savage, but they are all against us with one council, to be with us in a state of war. All the nations are sitting at peace and quiet, and the poor of your people Israel are wavering, washed away and depleted, and the blood of fathers and sons touched and the blood of merciful women and their children intermingled and the blood of bridegrooms and brides, the blood of pious men and women, the blood of decent men and women, the blood of brothers and sisters. Let not the earth cover their blood. Eretz al techasi damam. We said these things in Slicho, and I think your printouts say the word forgiveness there, which is a typo. We said these things in Slicho. This is a quote from one of the Slicho prayers, which talks about how, you know, everybody else is at peace, but the Jewish people are, you know, our blood is being spilled. I can't find this in the Slicho, by the way. I tried to do a quick search. It may be reflective of the fact that there are many different versions of Slicho and different communities have different Slicho liturgies. And this was in his Slicho. I'm not sure that it's in ours, but this is... Right, knowing what's what's yet to come, exactly. We said these things in Slichot, but did we say it only in Slichot? And only today on Rosh Hashanah Eve? Sounds like it's from the Slichot of Erev Rosh Hashanah, so it was said, you know, the, the morning before they were gathering. Isn't it all year that we see this? And not just in the book of Slichot, but in the book of life. Meaning this is not just a line from the liturgy of the Slichot. This is descriptive of our world. And together with the prophet Jeremiah, here we have to say regarding the past year. So again, he's situating us in what was the, for, let's just get, kind of take a, a moment to say, what have we seen so far? The setting of this is Rosh Hashanah. It's a powerful day. It's not just Rosh Hashanah for the Jewish people, but it's a Rosh Hashanah somehow for the entire world. And, um, you know, all of our fates are hanging in the balance. Now, after having grouped the Jewish people together with the whole world, he now again moves towards the distinction. But you know what? We don't experience things the same way. For the whole world, this is going to be remembered as a year of peace. For us, it was a year of great bloodshed. The whole world has gone to war against us. 
And that's kind of what he wants to develop from here. And so for us, this has been a year of the book of Jeremiah who says, I have lamented my grief. My heart is aching. Here is the voice of my daughter from a distant land. Now he's going to do a kind of a classical midrashic approach where he's going to take the different phrases and offer novel interpretations of them to make them sort of a, a banner for what we experienced this year. And indeed, he writes, each one of us also has more than enough individual hardships. Now it's taking a moment. He's been thinking nationally. He's taking a moment to reflect on personal hardship. Many, many of us are now standing with broken hearts and feel that their wings have been clipped, the flowers withered, the hopes disappointed, and their sun has set, completely sunk. Okay, so that's that's the first phrase. Mavligiti alayagon. I lament my grief, my own personal grief. But still, I am sorry for my grief. Now he makes a play on the word mavligiti, I am sorry, which also means suppress. It's possible to suppress this grief of alai li bidavai, the second phrase, my heart is aching, of the individual's troubles, right? Yes, we stand here and we feel our own troubles, but we actually have to suppress those troubles because all these troubles have already become a habit because, no, that's the way of the world. We all have individual hardships. We have to put that aside for a moment. Why? Because of what the end of the phrase, uh, the end of the verse from Jeremiah says, here is the voice of my daughter from a distant land. A voice of weak obedience. Uh, obedience isn't the right term there. I should. It's a voice of weak cry. A voice of grief and sigh. A voice that pierces the kidneys and the heart. A voice that comes out of nature, almost transcends nature. Even for Am HaMilumad B'Tsarot, the people well-learned, well-trained in troubles. Meaning, okay, we all have our individual hardships, but what we really need to put our ear to is a voice that's crying out from a distant land of hardships beyond, far beyond what our individual suffering is. What is that? He tells it straight. Haven't you all heard the voice coming from our brothers from Ukraine, Meachenu Ukraina, who are simply being led like sheep to the slaughter? And now we get a very sharp, learned, um, you know, uh, midrash from him. I just said like sheep, like sheep for the slaughter. But I said that just for the sake of fluent speech, because really this parable is no longer sufficient at all. Meaning, like sheep to the slaughter, that's just like a saying. But actually, it's worse than that. It's not like sheep to the slaughter. Why? Because there are also special laws about a sheep for the slaughter. The Torah has rules about how you're supposed to slaughter sheep. For example, Otov et beno lo tishchatu echad. You're not supposed to slaughter a sheep and its child on the same day. It's a, a, a law of compassion that the Torah has and the like. As for the slaughter of these brothers of ours, there is no law and justice at all. It's permitted to slaughter them, even him and his son. It's permitted to slaughter them with a defective knife, which is not allowed in the Jewish laws of Shechita. With them, everything is permissible and everything is granted. So our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are worse than sheep to the slaughter. Not even the rules of slaughtering sheep are being carried out about them. Here is the voice of my people from a distant land, that the number of those killed and slaughtered reached more than 80,000 Jews. Now, there are a lot of historical, um, there's a wide range of historical um, opinions about how many Jews died in the 1919 pogroms in Ukraine. But the numbers range from 50,000 to 200,000. So his figure is very likely to be accurate or perhaps even a, a low estimate of the, of the pogroms that were carried out against the Jews of Ukraine in the year 1919. And there are entire cities in which there is not a single Jewish person left to mourn the dead. And there are large congregations where women gather in the synagogue and pray and quote a minion to honor the memory of the souls of their husbands and children of whom no trace remains. Now, I don't know um, whether he's being metaphorical, figurative, or literal, but it's actually just a fascinating little insight. It, it may be that so many men died that communities didn't have a minion, but their wives still had the practice of coming to shul to pray for them. And he puts minion in quotes because of the orthodox notion that only men you know, constitute a minion, but yet there was this instinct 
by the bereaved widows to come together and form community and utter whatever prayers they uttered in memory of their husbands and of their sons, of whom no trace remains. 80,000 Jews. But our feelings have already darkened completely. Dimmed, maybe, is a better translation. Until the point that we express this number in a calm and pleasant way, as if it were just a dry number in front of us. And now he quotes a line from Eicha, from Lamentations. Michutz shikla cherev, babait kamavet. Outside the sword bereaves, and in the house there is like death. We have come to this, now he's going to again offer a little twist on this verse. We have come to this, to the point that we don't feel the pain at all, because we are no longer considered living flesh, like we don't even, we're numb, we don't even have feelings. And all those who are killed outside the sword here are considered to us at home as dead, as if they died at home as is the way of all people. In other words, he's reading this verse from Lamentations, which says, means to just describe, you know, the sword is killing people outside and people in our own homes are dying. But he's sort of saying, people are dying all over the place, out, right outside of you. And you're treating it as though, you know, someone died in their bed at home in the natural course of things. Yet this is so profoundly unnatural, but we are, he's, I don't know that he's criticizing as much as he's just describing the numbers are so staggering, we've become numb to it. We can't even feel it. We treat it as though it's a matter of course, as though this is just the way of the world in which people die in their beds. But in fact, this is a staggering, staggering loss. And indeed, woe to us, shakach al tabi amenu, that such has risen in our days. Okay? So he's you know, saying what we need to think about this year is the loss of our brothers in a distant land and what they've endured, and not to allow ourselves to become numb to it. Um, it is a profound, profound loss. Let us not let our individual hardships, um, you know, uh, block out what we need to be sensitive to for our brothers and sisters. Aval, becholzot, but still and after all of this, kine yom tov hayom. Today is a yom tov. It's a great yom tov. It's a Yom Tov which we are obliged to do with joy because Simchat Yom Tov Mitzvah, the, the, the idea of having a joyous experience of the holiday is a commandment. So take a look and see. Our enemies in the soul, Oyvenu Benefesh, have taken and robbed us of everything we have. But one thing they could not rob us of in any way, Zehu HaShofar. This is the Shofar. The shofar is muchan umizuman. It's ready and prepared, etzel bal hatokea, with the one who's going to blow it. And as long as it is in our midst, our hope is not yet lost. How does he say our hope is not yet lost? Od lo avda tikvatenu. Now, the poem of Hatikva, although it did not become adopted as Israel's national anthem until a later point, was written in the late 19th, early 20th century and was already being used as an early Zionist, you know, hymn um, in, you know, in the in the early Zionist congresses, no doubt that again, whether this was the original or a translation, um, he intended to draw specifically on the words of Hatikva. As we have known since then, this is the ancient shofar, the traditional shofar, whose history dates back to Abraham, our forefather. And now he quotes from uh, the Binding of Isaac story, the story which is the reading of the second day of Rosh Hashanah, uh, although I believe this was delivered on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And he looked, and behold, a ram behind, entangled in the thicket by its horns. This is the moment in the story, right, where the angel has told Abraham, stay your hand. And, uh, and he looks up, and he sees uh, a ram caught in the thicket, and he offers that as an offering in place of, of Yitzchak. And the word that's strange is the word achar, like in the back or like another, a second, a second ram almost. And the interpreters have already asked what the word behind achar is and who was the first ram. And they conclude because Avraham went so happily to the binding that Isaac himself, his only son, was considered a ram to him. And the real ram was considered to him then only as another ram. Meaning, the reason the Torah says there was a, a ram behind, like a second, a backup or a follow-up ram, 
is because Abraham committed himself so wholeheartedly to what God asked him to do that his son became to him like a ram that he was ready to offer as an offering. Okay, lots to say about, you know, the binding of Isaac and, and all of that. We sort of put it, a drop on the side for a moment. <clears throat> and according to the words of Chazal about the scripture, according to the words of the sages about this line from Song of Songs, I have sworn to you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the armies or by the hinds of the field, which the congregation of Israel, this is the Midrashic interpretation of this line from Song of Songs, swears by this to all 70 nations who make their blood like the blood of the deer and the blood of the ram. Meaning this is a reference to the way other nations persecute the Jewish people and spill our blood. But as long as the shofar of the true ram is in our hands, we will not be afraid of anything. Because it, the shofar, testifies to us like a hundred fit and faithful witnesses. By the way, why do you think he chooses the number a hundred here? Because there are a hundred shofar blasts. So the show, the presence of the shofar and its hundred sounds testify like a hundred witnesses. The fact that we have the shofar, that finally an angel of God will come, who will announce from one end of the world to the other, the words, Al tishlach yadcha el hana'ar v'al ta'as lo ma'uma. Don't put your hand on the boy and don't do anything to him. In other words, the fact that we have the shofar, which is a symbol of the second ram, the real ram, the actual ram that was offered, is a reminder that Isaac was not sacrificed, that he was freed and that a ram took his place. And that happened because of the voice of the angel that called out from the heavens, do not put your hand on the boy. And so Rav Amiel is trying to say to his people, with everything we've endured and our blood being spilled, we we look at the shofar as a reminder of the fact that there will be a call from one end of the world to an, to the other end, saying an end to bloodshed, an end to the spilling of blood. Not only that, isn't this the shofar of giving the Torah? As the quote uh, from, from the Revelation says, there was thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud on the mountain and a very loud sounding shofar. And this is the shofar of the Jubilee, the Yovel year, about which it is said, and you shall sound the shofar of Truah and proclaim liberty in the land to all its inhabitants, and you shall return each to his possession and each to his family. And it is also the shofar of the Mashiach, that a great trumpet will sound, shofar gadol yitaka, and the lost in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt will come. And when you hear the sound of the shofar, you are hearing on the one hand the voice of the ram when his blood is shed, like the blood of the ram. But on the other hand, you are also hearing the voice of the giving of the Torah, the voice of the Jubilee calling out freedom in the land, and the voice of the Messiah. So this is kind of the shift now from the context of what we've endured over this last year and what we need to be sensitive to, to the idea, but it's Rosh Hashanah, and there we have to find a way to be hopeful. So we look at this symbol, which is never taken from us, the shofar. If we have nothing else, we have a shofar. Actually, when I think about um, Ted Schneider, uh, who was a cherished community member uh, and survivor from Vienna, actually made his way to Israel and was involved in the, uh, in the founding of the state. And um, I have a shofar, which he brought from over from, from Europe and uh, kept as part of his family's kind of... Um, special, special possession. So, you know, wherever we go, we take our shofar with us. And the shofar is symbolic of the fact that, you know, there will be an end to the bloodshed, even as it reminds us of the shed blood of the ram um, and of us being taken like sheep to the slaughter. But it simultaneously is the shofar of the giving of the Torah, the shofar of a, of a time of freedom and the shofar of the Mashiach. And this shofar will really rend the Satan asunder. Not only the Satan who sees and is not seen, meaning that Satan that we talk about, the accuser or, or whatever that devil force is that you know occupies some place in, in Jewish thought and philosophy, but also the B'nai HaSatan, the sons of Satan, the human manifestations of evil, who not see and are not seen, but who see and unfortunately who are really seen, who exist in our world, the sons of Satan of all the inhabitants of the earth that are as many as the sands of the sea, all the inhabitants of the earth and those who dwell in land 
will hear as the shofar is blown. One of the lines from uh, from the Rosh Hashanah Musaf Amida. Kol Yoshvei Tevel Veshochnei Aretz Kitkoa Shofar Tishmau. I think it's one of the of the verses of the shofar wrote section. Right, everybody hears the shofar. Now he's sort of going back to his point in the way that it's not just Rosh Hashanah for the Jewish people, even though we're the only ones who observe it as a holiday, but it is for the world. Even though the shofar is our symbol, somehow the shofar blast is heard by all, even if metaphorically or figuratively. And you will necessarily hear whether you want it or not. And even if you put a stake in your ears, it will not do you any good because the sound of the shofar will penetrate your wrath and your fury. Meaning you enemies of Israel, you will hear the sound of the shofar. You can't close your ears to the sound of the shofar and what it stands for, which is the, the future deliverance. Absolute victory, this is a quote, is on the side of one who can last one hour longer than the enemy. Now, uh, I did a little Googling about this, and there are a whole host of variations of this quote um, from this era, from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, one, I think, was attributed to Alfred Lord Tennyson, others to, you know, statespeople. Some of them are, one was, I think, put in, you know, as a as a teaching of Napoleon that, you know, the braver man is the man who lists, lasts a quarter of an hour longer than his enemy, right? Then in the end of the day, you know, people fight and who really wins? Just the one who lasts a little longer. Absolute victory, this is his version of the quote, is on the side of the one who can last one hour longer than the enemy. So what he's doing here is integrating a quote that was clearly part of the common discourse um, in this time. This is what we learned in the last year, 5679, 1919. On Rosh Hashanah last year, the Germans still had the upper hand and conquered almost the entire world. But their opponents did not let their spirit flag and put their trust in the aforementioned proverb. All we need to do is outlast them. And from what we see now, this proverb has become true. But the truth compels us to say, <clears throat> by the way, I think I've mentioned this before, I think this is like a very classic rhetorical sermonic flourish. The, But if we're really honest with ourselves, or if we're really being truthful, we have to admit, right? So he has a variation. Ha'emet nitna lahagid. The truth must be told, or truth compels us to say, that after all, it cannot be called an absolute victory in the full sense of this word. Because a victory of the last hour, meaning the one who wins just by virtue of outlasting a little longer, is only a victory for an hour. But we have another saying, that the absolute victory comes to the one on whose end of days it is. Meaning it's not, that's as a short-term victory. The real victory is the one to whom acharit hayamim, to whom the end of days belongs. And the end of days is on our side. Only we will be the only ones who will last longer than all of them, as the prophet Micah says, and it will be at the end of days that the mount of the house of the Lord will be firmly established, Barosh Haharim, at the top of the mountains. Meaning, okay, you know, in this, in this world war, some nations were victorious and some nations fell, but that's not the end of the story. The ultimate victory will be the survival of the Jewish people uh, and, the, and, the, and the victory of the Jewish people at the end of days. But even then, we will not demand revenge from all our enemies, as we see from the victors of now. Rather, our only revenge will be that, and now he quotes again from the High Holiday Amidah, Olatatik patzpiha v'chol harisha kula ka'ashan tichle ki ta'avir memshelet zadon min ha'aretz. Injustice will have nothing more to say. All wickedness will fade away like smoke as you sweep the rule of arrogance from the earth. Meaning, for us, victory is not about you know, rubbing our our opponents' noses in the dirt. For us, victory is about bringing a better world order without injustice, without arrogance, without wickedness. That's the ultimate victory that we seek. So this is kind of his, you know, his note of hope, not just the shofar, but the fact that when you look out on the horizon of history, even this world war is a small piece of a journey to a much, much better place, a journey to a place where, the Jewish people will be the victors, but victory will not be about revenge. It'll be about ushering in an era of justice and peace. And the hundred voices that you will hear from the shofar blower. So he's zero coming, uh, taking us back now to really prepare ourselves for the shofar blasts that we're going to hear. The hundred voices that you will hear from the shofar blower. The voices of the shvarim and truah, 
of moaning moans and wailing wails. He's going to quote this a bunch of times, so just say what it is. Genuchei genach v'yelulei yelil. We saw this in Rav Amital as well, uh, the cries of the mother of Sisra. When the Talmud describes what is the shofar blast, it says it's the sound of cries. The shvarim and the truah are genuchei genach v'yelulei yelel. The moaning sound of moans and the wailing sounds of wails. Okay, so these voices, these hundred blasts of shofar of wails and moans, these voices announce to the whole world, to all the inhabitants of the earth and all the dwellers of the land, to all the 70 nations that seem like 70 lions rising over us, over this little sheep. By the way, of course, that I think is a uh, a play to the Isaiahic version of the end of days when the lion and the lamb will lie down together, right? So he's sort of saying, yes, right now it feels like they are lions and we are sheep, but in the end, there will be an ultimate peace. But the shofar blast cries out to all our 70 nations of lion enemies. Al tafchidu otanu. You don't frighten us. Utsu eitza v'tufar davu davar v'loyakum ki Emanuel, as is the HIR's custom to say after Aleinu, uh, three times a day. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Anachnu hinenu ha'am ha'atik yomin. We are the people of old, the ancient people. So learned in troubles that we say, Ashrei ha'am yodei tu'a. Fortunate is the nation who knows the trua. What did he just say the trua is? It's the sound of cries. It's the, it's the sound of suffering. We're so experienced in suffering that we say fortunate is the people who knows the trua. We know the moaning moans and wailing wails for many thousands of years. And yet look and see, we are still alive. This is what we're saying to the other nations with the shofar blasts. We are a people embodied by the sounds of the shofar that you're hearing. The wails and cries of suffering is our story. But look, we're still alive. And the shofar is still in our hand and in our heart, despite all the robbers and bandits who want to rob it from us. Ashrei ha'am yodei tua. Blessed are the people who know the trua. Only this people is a happy one. Ashrei. The people who know how to live also in the trua of the groanings and wails of the night should again be the, the moaning moans and wailing wails. In the light of your face, they will walk. Remember the second half of that verse. Fortunate is the people who know the truah. We will walk in the light of God's face. We know that all of this comes to us, all of our suffering, because we walk in the light of God's face. And for that, the whole world hates us. Okay, this is the little take on anti-Semitism, right? They hate us because they know that we are God's chosen people. We have many, many theories of anti-Semitism. We have many, many attitudes towards the notion of a chosen people. But this is the framework that he's offering, is the comfort that he's attempting to say. Why do they hate us? They hate us because they know God loves us. We walk in the light of God's face. This illumination of our face, or of God's face towards us, will be dearer to us than any of the world's delights. doesn't matter what, what, what anybody else has. We have the shining light of God on our faces. We are made beautiful and splendorous by it. In fact, now we are not the only, in fact, now we are not the only ones in this day of Tua. Okay, now circling again, you see how he moves back and forth between situating the Jewish people as unique and putting them in the context of we're all experiencing something, but our experience is different, but we're all experiencing something, right? So now he's back to the place of we're all experiencing something. We're not the only ones in this day of Truah. The whole world is already in a state of moaning moans and wailing wails. Everyone is drowning in a sea of blood and tears. Everyone has already come to an awareness of what we knew thousands of years ago. That, and here he quotes a line from the Mishnah, again, a clever rereading. Shofar shetzipahu zahav pasul. A shofar whose mouth is coated with gold is invalid to fulfill the mitzvah. You take a ram's horn and you say, you know, I want to put a little gold plating around the mouth of it. It invalidates it for performing the mitzvah. But here's what he interprets from it, right? That's something we knew thousands of years ago in the Mishnah, but the whole world is now coming around to realize it. And they lay all the blame on the gods of silver and gold who brought about all this destruction, right? Now they understand too that if you're preoccupied with wealth and greed, you drive the world into the ground. You bring about world wars. 
right? It's the it's the desire to claim land and territory and wealth that creates a discord and seas of blood. Which is why there are now many world leaders who want to break these idols. Let's shatter that and bring bread and freedom to all. I assume this is a uh, you know uh, Marxism uh, socialism comment, right? So so forget we we don't need to pursue wealth. We have you know equal equal uh, access. Uh, of 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 you know resources to all bread for all okay um, but they must know here's the message to those socialist Marxist leaders that a day of trua holy convocation the great trua that is being heard now the moaning moans and wailing wails throughout the world calls to all because there is only one correction for this if you want to get rid of the wailing wails you need mikra kodesh a holy convocation. It is impossible to obtain bread and freedom for all if holiness and purity do not prevail in the world. I don't know exactly what he's getting at here, but there's some critique that socialism or Marxism lacks. Maybe it's the religion. Maybe it's the comment that it's a... They don't. Right. It's, I assume it's sort of a comment about, you know, the anti-religiousness um, of these of these ideologies and philosophies, right? You need to have Kedushah and Tahara, core religious concepts in the world. So this is about, you know, again, this is his reading of the fact that the Torah combines Yom Tu'ah, Mikra Kodesh. This day of, of blasting needs to also have holiness. A day of Tru'ah, a holy convocation, when it comes together with holiness, refers to the shofar. But without holiness, it is just a horn, keren, which is the same term for shofar, but an animal's horn, whose nature is to harm. This is, again, a very clever allusion to the first Mishnah in Baba Kama in the Laws of Damages, which talks about an animal's horn, which is used to gore. And so he's saying a shofar can be one of two things. It can be a call to revelation and redemption if it's paired with holiness. But if it lacks holiness, then it's just an animal's horn, which is going to gore. It's just going to be a source of violence and conflict. So, you know, yes, Get rid of the obsession with wealth and greed. Yes, share equally, but you have to do it with religion, with a sense of holiness, a sense of faith. And indeed, in the last year, different parties tried to bring repair to the world. But as long as this corrective is not made, the repair of Latakeno Lamba Malchut Shaddai, rectifying the world and the kingdom of God, all the corrections in the world will not be of any use. This is the only repair for the whole world. Only this shofar the shofar of a day of trua, holy convocation, can bring to the state of each man will return to his estate and his family, right? The, the, the shofar of the jubilee, of restoration uh, to, to our ancestral inheritance. But without it, all the revolutions, and of course that's an intentional term, right, right in the time of the Bolshevik revolution, all the revolutions in the world will not help anything. Now, you remember that the very, very beginning, he quoted two lines, Ashrei ha'am yodei tua, fortunate is the people who know the shofar blast. And he's understood that now as referring to the fact that the Jewish people know sorrow, we've known hardship, but we also know the shofar, which is the very same symbol of the fact that an end to bloodshed will come, revelation and redemption will come. And after that, he quotes the verse, Ashrei yoshvei beitecha, fortunate are those who dwell in your house, the two ashreis. And yes, he says, blessed are the people who know the trua as above, as we've explained over this, you know, last uh, number of minutes, these last paragraphs. And with it all, their spirit does not flag at all, even though we know well the, the broken sounds of the shofar, our spirit does not flag at all. And on the contrary, through this, they become stronger for the work of our creator. We devote ourselves because of our understanding that the shofar, sticking with the shofar, even with its cries, will lead us to a better place. It strengthens our resolve to serve God. And in the light of your face, they will walk. But will we always be only knowing the Trua? Meaning, is our fate to eternally be the people of brokenness and suffering? Will we always be only happy in agony? Meaning, will the, will the light of God only be a light that is experienced through hardship? And all our love will be in afflictions of love. That's a term that the Gemara and Brachot uses, Yisurin shel Ahava. Yes, we suffer, but the sufferings are somehow a sign of love. No and no. Lo valo. Od yavo hayom. The day will come 
והיום הזה כבר עומד מאחרי כותלינו. This day is just on the other side of the wall. שנקרא גם, when we will also proclaim, אשרי יושבי ביתך. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. And when we will sit in our home, בביתנו. בית אבות, the home of our ancestors. בית הלאומי שלנו, our national home. Here the Zionism comes, you know, into the crescendo. בית ישראל, the house of Israel. בארץ ישראל, in the land of Israel. So this was delivered in 1919 to a people that experienced so much hardship and war, and now we're in the throes of revolutions of all kinds being fomented all around them, a people that um, was being sensitized to the cries of those who were suffering not far from where they were, um, to, to awaken themselves to the concerns of fellow Jews elsewhere. Um, and uh, the call to know that for all we've endured, if we stick with it, right, in the end of the day, he's also trying to tell them, don't give up the faith. Stick with Torah and mitzvot, even though it has, it has been uh, accompanied by so much suffering, uh, stay with it, because it's not just, you know, the, the goodness of knowing that we are chosen, even though that's a source of so much, you know, pain and hardship and loss, but we will yet arrive at the time when we have the true joy of feeling that we dwell wholeheartedly in God's home, in God's land, uh, in, in, a time, in a time of peace. Uh, I see my dad and then Mama Toby. Go ahead, Dad. Uh, this is a combination personal and historical comment. Yes. Um, my father was living in Ukraine in 1919. Uh, the Hexler, Axelrod family uh, was we're living in a town outside of Kamenets, which is the southwestern part of Ukraine. And um, Ukraine, uh, there was a civil war going on. The Bolsheviks were trying to uh, take as much land as possible. And the, uh, the people in Ukraine, uh, with their warlords, were trying to oppose them. So you had the, the Reds the left wing, and you had the, the whites, uh, the right wing, and they were fighting each other. Yeah. And each side considered the Jews to be members of the other side. Mm -hmm. So the Jews were, in fact, the enemies of both sides. Yeah. And that's why so many Jews were being killed. Yeah. They, there was no one there to protect them. Yeah. 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 They're thankful that your father uh, made it out and that we're yeah. that we're here today. Uh, and um, thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, Mama Toby, bye. That just sounds so familiar that, yeah. you know, now it's the Jews' fault because they're for Trump and it's the Jews' fault because they're for Paris. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about this, besides that it's so powerful, so beautifully done, um, is that he doesn't fall back from making political statements uh -huh. and tying it into Judaism and the Jewish yes. positions yes. From, and the Jewish tradition. Yes. Um, and today, I think, um, without making any comments about present rabbis, yes. <laughs> synagogues, so many uh, people from the on the pulpit are afraid to take any kind of position because for a, a lot of reasons. Number one, they say, but our congregants believe everything. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. We have congregants that are on one side of the political spectrum mm -hmm. and congregants that are on the other side of the political spectrum. And I'm out here saying, yeah, but Jewish tradition and Jewish values do lead one to take certain political mm -hmm. positions and he's not afraid mm -hmm. to say that mm -hmm. and today i think we are afraid to say that interesting um, yeah and then there are other things like you know you lose your tax status if you become political right and not right, religion, right. Blah, blah, blah. yeah but you know we you rarely hear somebody say from the pulpit this is what you should be doing uh, and this is what you should be supporting because this is our Jewish right, values. Right, right, right. Just don't say it. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, uh, fair, fair comment. And uh, you know, this 
the stake, I wonder what the stakes were for rabbis in that time. You know, on the one hand, again, they, I think they were so disenfranchised politically that none of that really mattered. Um, but vis-a-vis their own congregants, you know, if there was only one rabbi in the town, could they get fired if they upset people? Uh, you know, I don't know. Was there a different sense of the way rabbinic authority was viewed, what people were looking for? Were they more or less free to speak their minds? Did they feel more or less free to speak their minds? Yeah. Congregation? Yes, yes, yes. What factions were represented? Fascinating question. Yeah, yeah. Alan? I mean, I, I think that towards the end, when he talked about the fact that you can't have this um, better society without also the spiritual mm -hmm. aspect of it. And I think of my parents who were not, you know, they, they were communists and they, my father in particular, believed that the message of religion would, was that, things were going to be better no matter what. And mm -hmm. so it was, oh, what, I'm, now I'm having a senior moment. What was it of the masses? The, Opiate. 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 Yeah. The masses. yeah. And, and he really believed that. Yeah. And so he felt that, that religion would stop people from taking the actions mm -hmm. they needed to take mm -hmm. in order to um, fight for justice. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's heartening to see this, mm -hmm. you know, that you can't really have one without the other. But mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a very modern take on religion. You know, God will provide. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. let's just sit back and wait. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. discussion of that in Yitz's play. Uh, great. Yes. In Rev Yitz's uh, new book, The Triumph of Life. This era, we have to do something. We can't just say, "Yes, God, no. yes, you know, yes, it has to yes, be a yes." And yes. I think that that was the thing that was missing from the way they looked at it. And it wasn't just my father. I mean, it was a whole group of people yes. who all were Jewish, and all were also felt that they had to. Um, change the world for the better mm -hmm. but that if they but that religion couldn't fit in there somehow yeah 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 great other comments from those on zoom i thought it was an incredible an incredible uh dress whatever yes dress uh, yeah sermon yeah i was i was very impressed with it Thank you, Estelle. That makes me feel extra great. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I, I I feel similarly, and I find that reading Rav Amiel often moves me. Um, he has a you know a way of 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 writing and speaking that I find very powerful. The way he interweaves, and hopefully you got a flavor for it as I try to do those little explanations of the way he takes verses that again I don't know how learned his congregation was, but for those who have a, a basic familiarity or a 200 level familiarity with Jewish liturgy and Jewish text, they would be phrases and and uh, and snippets that are very familiar, but he 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 you know re recasts them in a kind of clever, compelling, sharp sort of way. I mean, I just think about that, you know, that line of our people are being led like sheep to the slaughter, but not even like that. Worse, because there are rules for how you slaughter sheep and our people are being slaughtered, parent and child on the same day. Again, it's too horrific to kind of say like i appreciate the cleverness of it but there's a power to taking our 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 texts that speak on their own and adding a layer just in a sentence or two or a turn of phrase to kind of heighten them sharpen them put them in conversation with one another and he consistently does that um uh, i'm sorry that more of his writing is not in translation um but slowly one at a time i'm trying to do it and uh yeah and yeah. His grandfather could have understood a sermon in. Right. Yes. Yeah. So we have to go back to that question. I have to go back to find out that question of what language they were written and delivered in. Yeah. Elaine. Uh, uh, Stephen. Hold on one moment. Hold on, Carol, one moment. Elaine was just saying something, then I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Elaine. Yeah, I was just wondering who the congregation was. Yeah. Um, at what level of education? Yeah. Yeah. So I have to do more homework on that. Carol, you're going to say something? Please. Yeah, I, 
Um, I think this sermon could have been given at so many crucial times in Jewish yes. history. Yes. It could have been given in, in 1939. It could have been given before the destruction of the temple. Yes. So that the meaning of the shofar is so universal. Yes. Yes. So universal. yes. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, and, and as someone said in this space, it, it speaks to today very, very much. Yes. Um, you know, so, so many dimensions of it. And um, I, the, I don't know about from this one, but probably Rav Amiel will pop up in one or or another of my sermons over the high holidays because uh, you know the moments he he was living in, the experiences he had, and the way he speaks directly and and so artfully um, to our experiences uh, resonates with me very much. And so I'm especially glad to be able to share him with you. And um, next week, uh, Rabbi Sharon Brous, our most contemporary. Uh, next week, I mean, in two weeks, we'll do we'll look for a good Yom Kippur uh, sermon of, of hers to experience together. You, you know, it's almost as if we if we could only treat human beings as if they were animals, we we treat our animals better than we treat our fellow human beings. That, that is true in some cases. Absolutely. Uh, Ruby, the, the coming year, what's that, Carol? Go ahead. We should be, treat both with dignity. Yes, because. Absolutely. We don't know if God gave, you know, consciousness in the way we have it to animals. Yes. Some people think so, especially yes. scientists. Yes, yes. Ruby was asking about this. This coming new year is 5785. Uh, we are coming to the end of 5784 and coming to uh, Tafshin Pei Hei. For those who will be in shul on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, it's become my custom to offer a few um, as he describes in the beginning, the um, the militsim, the wordsmiths. It's my custom to um, uh, try to offer a few acronyms um, from Tafshin Pei uh, because we're in, in the 5700s. We can do this every year. Tafshin um, stands can stand for Tehei Shnat. May it be a year of. And then you can take the Pei and the Hei and create different acronyms of what we hope it will be a year of. For those who won't be in shul, certainly the one that's um, laying most on my heart is Teheshnat Pidyon Hashvuyim. May it be a year of the release of our hostages. Pidyon Hashvuyim, Peihe, Tafshin Peihe. May it be a year in which they came home. Let so. them go, not bring them home. Yes, yes, yes. All right, to see, we'll see each other in, uh, I hope, many times between now and then, but uh, in two weeks back in this space. Uh, let it be a Shana Tova, good, a good year for all. Thank you. Good day to all.